Praise the Lord. Has the Lord done something for you? If you ask me, I will tell you what is done for me through the blood that cannot lose its power. It will work in our lives in Jesus' name. Let's rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you because of Calvary. We thank you because of that blood that cannot lose its power. Lord, we pray it will walk in every life in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that that power will know it afresh once again today. And Lord, we pray you'll bless everyone. All those who have ministered to us in singing and playing. And all those who are ministering to us in standing as ushers and choir and, uh, and security people. And all these other people and our leaders. Bless everyone in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, for the first section over there as the word is coming to them through interpretation. As we are blessing your ministers over here, you bless them too abundantly in Jesus' name. Bless everyone, Lord, through this blood that will never, never, never lose its power. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... I'm not going to release it to sit down to you. Give me a good amen. amen. Thank you and God bless every one of you. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles once again. And we come to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. We now come to the conversion of Paul the Apostle. As he tells the story himself. And we're looking at Christ's irresistible saving power. As we think about Christ, and we think about a God, Father in heaven, Father God in heaven, and we think about the power of the Lord and everything surrounding the coming of Christ here into the world, and then what the Lord has done and what He keeps doing until this time. There are some things I want to bring to your attention before I read even the passage. Number one, God's program. God has a program. And in line detail from all eternity. In fact, when you read Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it talks about Christ slain, killed, crucified from the foundation of the world. He has a program. And then number two, there is God's pronouncement. He didn't just have the, pro uh, the program in his heart, in his mind, and kept in a file in heaven. He pronounced it. He proclaimed it. God's pronouncements and then God's promise as he brought men and women into this world because he had a program and because he had made a pronouncement and now he gives us his promise God's promise number four after giving that promise he has a purpose for that and he outlines that in the word God's purpose and then for that purpose to be fulfilled since there are many contrary, a kind of power, opposition, and resistance, what do you need? God's power to be able to do what he has ordained to do, to be able to effect what he has pronounced, and to be able to accomplish what he has decided from the very courts of heaven. And then God's perfection. What he did, he did perfectly. Without any iota, even a small, in negligible, inconsequential, insignificant thing missing out of his program. And then when you put it all in all, when everything has been done, when everything has been accomplished, and when God has accomplished every program, every pronouncement, fulfilled every promise, and then he has effected everything, we have God's prayer minutes. God's prayer minutes. Number one, God's program. Number two, God's pronouncement. Number three, God's promise. Number four, God's purpose. Number five, God's power. Number six, God perfect, God's perfection. Number seven, God's what? Prayer minutes. Number one, God's program. Irreversible. Irreversible. When God decided, this is what I will do. So try to go against that. 
And Saul tried so that he could derail, disturb, destroy this program of God. But I want to tell you, there might be one million, one trillion souls in the world. But they cannot reverse the program of God. God's program, irreversible. God's pronouncement, irrefutable. Irrefutable. Something you cannot do doubt you cannot destroy you cannot abolish when god has made a pronouncement and that pronouncement comes out of him god's pronouncements irrefutable god's promise god's promise irreplaceable irreplaceable this is what we need he knows the need of the whole of humanity he knows the need of every man and every woman. He knows the need of every child, every offering of Adam. And there is no replacement for that promise. God's promise, irreplaceable. God's purpose. God's purpose, irrevocable. It's not something that anybody can just come and say, I don't like that. I don't want that. I think I have a better idea when God has purpose to get something done. That purpose of God is irrevocable. And then God's power. Think about that. God's power from the foundation of the world on the, until the present time, until the time of the great tribulation, until the time of Christ coming back again, until the time God will bring all the nations together. And then he will judge them when God sits in that place, in that seat of authority and power. God's power irresistible irresistible when god says this is what he will do when god decides this is what you do god's power to get it done to accomplish it is irresistible god's perfection god's perfection when you look at god what he has done with angels and men what he has done with Israel and the other nations. What he has done with every single individual living on the face of the earth. And when you come to the edge of the world. And then you look back at everything in minutest details as to what God has done. You see God's perfection irreproachable. Irreproachable. It's not something you can find fault in. God should have done it this way. But he did it this way why did he do this why didn't he take it that they take that truth you'll find god's perfection that it will be irreproachable god's preeminence now god's preeminence irreducible irreducible it's not something you can say well it's not as preeminent as they ought to be we need to reduce this a little bit so that other people too will be able to have some glory and some honor and some exaltation god's Preeminence irreducible. And that's what we're finding out as we look at the program and the project of Saul of Tassels. They are taking some orders, they are taking some uh, kind of letters of authority out of Jerusalem. And was going to Damascus. He wanted to go and do some destructive work again. And then God said, Hey, I have a program. And that program is irreversible. I don't care what letter you have in your hand, what authority you depend on, and I don't care how fast you're moving, I don't care the intention of your heart, when God decides that this is what you will do, it will be done. I said it will be done. Isn't it a joyful thing to know that you're a child of the King of Kings? And that you're a follower of the Lord of Lords. And that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has made you not just a member of the church of the living God. He has made you a minister in the church of the living God. And now you are part of the program. I said you are part of his program. And tell me who can conquer you. Tell me who can destroy you. Tell me who can reverse the path by which the Lord is leading you. It cannot be done. It will never be done. What God has purposed in your life, in your family, and in your ministry, it will be done in Jesus' name. 
anytime you're feeling a little bit weary and a little bit tired a little bit weak, you sit back and then, then you think about god has a program and i'm part of that program and god has made a pronouncement and that pronouncement includes me and god has a promise and that promise i'm rejoicing and dipping myself soaking myself in the promises of the almighty god he has a purpose and i'm in the middle in the very center of that purpose and the power of the almighty god to effect what he has decided is effecting and using that power in me and then he's working out his perfection in my life and then his preeminence it'll be all in all in my life in your life you relax and just look back and know that satan has nothing to do with you and he cannot derail he cannot destroy and he cannot take anything away from the plan and the purpose that god almighty has towards you i'm looking at isaiah chapter 43 isaiah chapter 43 and we're looking at verse 13 isaiah chapter 43 and we're reading it from verse 13 yea before the day was i am he and there is none that can deliver out of my hand i will work and who shall let it who shall hinder it nobody i said nobody i said chapter 14 in i said chapter 14 verse 24 the lord of hosts has sworn saying surely as i have thought so shall it come to pass what, what will you worry about? What will you ever, ever worry about? Worry about? He has his thought for the church. His thought for the ministers in the church. His thoughts on your behalf. He said, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. Everybody say that. As I have purposed. So shall it stand. His purpose will be fulfilled in your life. In verse 27, for the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Nobody. Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 35. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay his hand or say unto him, Watch doest thou god will do what he wants to do we're looking at job chapter 9 job chapter 9 and i'm reading from verse 4 job chapter 9 we're looking at it from verse 4 he is wise in heart and mighty in strength who has hardened himself against him and has prospered Saul was trying to harden himself against the almighty God and against the plan of God against the program of Christ upon this church upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and Saul of the Saul of Tarsus he was trying to join forces for the gates of hell wanting to destroy the church of the living God he could not do it until this day nobody will be able to do it god is wise in heart and god is mighty in strength who has hardened himself against the lord and has ever prospered and that's what brings us now to acts chapter 26 acts chapter 26 i'm reading from verse 9 acts 26 we're reading from verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which sin I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, 
having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them out in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, um, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and, and them that journeyed with me and when we were all watch falling to the earth can you imagine Saul couldn't ever imagine that anything will happen that will make him fall, in, fall to the ground without any human agent without the Christians fighting back without anybody knocking him the power that came from heaven and the light that shone from heaven he said we're all falling to the earth i had a voice speaking unto me and saying in the hebrew tongue saul saul why persecutest thou me who was he persecuting tell me out loud Everything that is done against you is done against Christ. And Christ will not accept humiliation after his exaltation. He has been exalted. And everything that is done to humiliate you, bring you down, persecute you, cause you pain and destroy you, is actually done against Christ. And Christ is not going to let that go just like that. He's not going to take any humiliating act after his exaltation. Exalted to the right hand of majesty on high. And so he asked Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet. The Lord will appear to you. And when the Lord appears to you, everything will become very different. Can you imagine all the sins this man had committed? All the evil this man had done. All the blasphemy this man had uttered. All the cruelty this man had effected. In a moment of time, Christ forgave him. Think about that. God will forgive everyone. As you come to the Lord and say, Who art thou, Lord? And you say, I'm Jesus. And you bend and bow before him. All your sins from the beginning till this time, everything will be wiped away. And then when he forgives, he'll forget. And then he'll make use of us as mighty instruments in the hand of God in Jesus' name. Rise and stand. Upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things and the which I will appear unto thee. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, the persecution of an irreconcilable sinner. The persecution of an irreconcilable sinner. Nobody could plead with that man. Nobody could beg him. He had no milk of human tenderness anywhere in his heart, in his mind, in his life. Nothing of the milk of human tenderness. Nothing of mercy. All he knew was Kill them, slay them, destroy them, persecute them, wipe them out, forget about them. The persecution of an irreconcilable sinner. Number two, the power of our irresistible savior. The power of our irresistible savior. Number three, the purpose of his irrefutable salvation. The purpose of his irrefutable salvation. Number one, the power of an irreconcilable sinner. 
the persecution, the persecution of an irreconcilable sinner. We're coming back to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. And we're looking at verse 9. I verily thought with myself. I can't we stop there for a moment. All your life is a demonstration of your thought. Any action that comes is what you thought before you did it. And where you are today, whether it's low or high, whether it's there or here, where you are today is the result, the accumulation, and the conclusion of all your thoughts since you were born. And where you will be tomorrow, what you will be in the future, will be a product, a consequence, a result of what you think. And it is as you think that you act. It is your action that leads to your habit. And it's the habit that leads to your character. It's your character that leads to your lifestyle. It's your lifestyle that leads to your destiny. And if you want a good destiny, it starts with what you think. On the inside, he said, I verily thought within myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And when he thought of that, then he actually went on to begin to do what he thought in the heart. In verse 10, which thing also I did. I thought it, I did it. I imagined it, I carried it out. The imagination of the heart, the thought of the mind, the disposition of your spirit within you. It is what you think about. And then you said, uh, which thing I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority. Authority. Uh, now, we're well, learning something here now. The people of the world can authorize something. It is not everything people of the world authorize that is acceptable in heaven. Do you know there are people who think because I've got authority and because I've got the backing of the people that matter, of the powers of the day, and because I've got the power, the authority, the backing, the support, and even the pay, the remuneration, the reward from those people, the powers that be. They think because of that authority, everything they do in that authority is right. But you know, Paul the apostle, when he was Saul, he had authority from the highest power in Jerusalem, in the nation of Israel. But having authority to do something, if it's not coming from heaven, doesn't make that thing right. And then he goes on to say in that, in verse 10, and then he said, which thing I did? He said, I put many people in prison. I mean, received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them out in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad now he knew he was what mad at that time he didn't think like that at that time but now looking back at what he did he said now i realize i was mad and it's good he didn't die at that time. You know, there are some things we do. Uh, not, not we, not, not those of us who are here. We are God's people. We are God's ministers. Give me a good amen. Yeah. There are some things that people do. And then when God touches your life and opens your eyes and you see very clearly, you say, how could I have done that? How could I have said that? How could I have gone that direction? I think at that time I was mad. He said, being exceedingly mad, he said, I persecuted them unto strange cities. That's the persecution. I don't want to go into you know, all the details of what he did. And, and all the details of the places they went and all the pain that he caused the people. And what I just want to find out is what was the result of the persecution? 
What was the effect of the persecution? Remember once again, God has a program. What was the effect of that persecution on the program? That, that's what I'm interested in. That's what you are interested in. God had made a pronouncement. And you want to find out, oh yes, it was mad, it was fanatical, and he was very cruel, and he did evil. What was the result of that cruelty and madness and insanity against the pronouncement of God? God had given a promise of what he will do, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and that everyone in heaven on earth and on the earth, they will give glory to this Jesus Christ. My desire, my concern is, what was the effect of the persecution of Saul against the promise of the Almighty God? God had a purpose. And the purpose is, he will select people out of all the nations unto himself. And I want you to know, Paul, are you so great? Are you so mighty? Are you so insane? Are you so mad? You are able to then destroy that purpose of the Almighty God. God has a power that is irresistible. And then I want you to know, yes, I've heard you, Paul. I've listened to what you've said. I've listened to what you've done. You went from city to city. You captured people. You imprisoned people. You compelled them to blaspheme. And you did this and that. I'm interested in knowing what was the fruit and the effect of what you've done. And you know, if I was doing something and I saw that what I'm doing is not bearing fruit, I'm going to check up again and say, why am I doing that? Why should I do that? What what the Lord wanted to do is doing what he wants to accomplish is accomplishing and the place he wants to take the church to is taking the church there and all the things that Saul of Tarsus did everything amounted to nothing I think it's good this man was confronted by the power higher greater than himself because the power of God is irresistible give me a good amen, amen. And then I want you to know, I've learned that God is perfect. You know, you read in Genesis and Exodus and you read in the Psalms in particular. And you see the perfection of God. And then I want to find out everything that Saul did. How did it affect? Did he take any iota, any jot, any teacher out of the perfection of the Almighty God? The answer is no. And so, uh, that is why you should be looking in the right direction. Uh, some of us are coming from countries where the church has been persecuted. Some of you are coming from locations, areas where the church has been persecuted. And then you're looking down because your persecutors are down. They are falling to the ground. You're looking down. You see these persecutors as this church is in this place what are we going to do what are we what are you going to do heaven has made a pronouncement already and whatever persecution is in that place will not take away jot a teacher out of the pronouncement of the almighty god in jesus name this church is marching on i said this church is marching on Whatever Saul does, whatever society does, whatever the situation may produce, it will not take anything away from the plan of God in Jesus' name. I know about the preeminence of the Almighty God is all in all. Is Alpha and Omega. Is the first and the last. Is preeminent, is prominent, and is every time is exalted high. And I want you to know all the persecution of Saul, everything that Saul did, what was the effect? Nothing. And that's the reason why all those persecutors, you look at them when they're foaming out their madness and insanity, you know, you know, just say they don't understand. But I know the program of God and this person will take nothing out of that program. I know the pronouncement of God and this persecution will take nothing out of that pronouncement. I know the promise of God and this persecution means nothing. I know the promise of God and the power of the almighty God and this persecution will not distract or take anything away or subtract anything from the power, the promise, the purpose of the almighty God. I know God is still perfect. God is still perfect. Church, are you with me? Is God perfect? I said, it's our God perfect. And all their persecution 
will mean nothing. Then, then you will rest and say, I know my God is preeminent. My God is preeminent. And whatever persecution, whatever pain, and whatever difficulty, whatever challenge, all this mad, you sin, persecutors may have, it will not take anything away from you. You will still reach where you will reach. You will get to where you will get to. And the Lord will accomplish all his purposes in your life in Jesus' name. The result, number one, spectacular conversion. Spectacular conversion. In spite of all the persecution, see all that Saul said that he did. In spite of everything that he did, there was still supernatural conversion. So I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. Acts, chapter 6, and I'm reading in verse 7. Acts, chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Spectacular conversions. Number two, supreme consecration. Supreme consecration. As Saul and his people, Saul and the Jews, Saul and the council, Saul and the Sanhedrin, as they were persecuting the people of God, it drove them to prayer. It drove them to consecration. It drove them to commitment. It drove them to say, ah, if they persecute us like this, for this that we proclaim, we're going to do more of it. Then the consequence was supreme consecration. I'm looking at chapter 4, uh, chapter 4 of Acts verse 34. Chapter 4 of Acts verse 34. Neither was there any was there any among them that large, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and they laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Then number three, scriptural strong conviction. Scriptural strong conviction. I, I thought, you know, the persecution will weaken them. No, you're a child of God. Persecution will never weaken you. Persecution will never destroy your faith. I, don't you remember the people of Israel? While Pharaoh and his people, while they're putting them to rigor and to real hard service, the more they oppress them, the more they grow. The more they oppress you, the more you will grow. You must benefit from that persecution. You must reap some joy and some fruit and some progress and success from that persecution. The persecution gave them scriptural strong conviction. Chapter 4 of Acts. Acts chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 4 verse 18. And he called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. The persecution did not weaken them. On the other hand, it strengthened them. You will be strong. Number four, it gave them spirit imparted courage. Spirit imparted courage. You might want to call it spiritual courage, but it's a kind of courage that the spirit of the living God injected into them. When the persecution, don't you remember when Peter, before he received the Holy Ghost, that when he made say, you must be one of them, he became so fearful and so timid that he said, no, I don't know the man. He began to curse, but then the Spirit of God came down and that Holy Ghost imparted unto him and injected him or something that is courage from heaven and the spiritual the spirit imparted courage you can see chapter 5 acts chapter 5 we're reading from verse 27 acts chapter 5 verse 27 it says and when they had brought them they set them before the council and 
the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly charge, command you that ye should not teach in this name? But behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men he gave them spirit imparted courage number five he gave them selfless communion selfless communion as they were persecuting them it drove them together in love in assembly in unity in union communion together you see that's what the persecution did they thought the persecution was scattered them and when they are scattered here and there they will lose all their effect they will lose all their all their project and all their program is when they are together they'll be able to put their forces together but the persecutors they miscalculated and those who persecute the people of God today you miscal they miscalculate because they are not here I said they are not here if I say you miscalculated it means you are there but we are not persecutors we're children of God we're ministers of the gospel. We are the people that have come to join us and join our hearts with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're marching on to victory in Jesus' name. But you know, all those persecutors, whatever their plans are, they miscalculate. I said they miscalculate. And it will not work in Jesus' name. It will only drive the church of God unto selfless communion. Let's look at chapter 4 verse 32. Acts chapter 4 verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which they possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Number 6, it drove them to soul winning commitment. Soul winning commitment. Soul winning commitment. The persecution was there. It didn't stop the program. It did not stop the pronouncement. It could not affect the promise. It could not affect the purpose of God or the power of God. It could not affect the perfection and the preeminence of God. All it did was to make the people more committed to soul winning. Soul winning commitment. Chapter 8 of Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 1. So was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. They were all scattered where? Jerusalem. They said Judea. And where? Tell me out loud. Uh, you know, uh, people don't understand. It's like when we listen to the message on Sunday, as it was written, as it was written, as it was written. People don't know that everything they do will get, the, will get Christ and get the church to the fulfillment of what was reaching here it says as the persecution rose up and escalated it says they were scattered abroad throughout the region of judea and samaria except the apostles put your finger there i'm coming to acts of the apostles chapter 1 verse 8 acts chapter 1 verse 8 and ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem that had been done and then now in all tell me out loud all judea after they have finished the work in jerusalem they ought to go to Judea, but they were slow, they were not going. And so what the persecution did was to blow them and drive them and move them in the direction of what had been reaching, as it was reaching. And then it says, and in Samaria, that's what we read in Acts chapter 8. And then it says, and unto the utmost part of the earth. And so when some things begin to happen, and then you are thinking, ah, all those promises I got, and all the pronouncements of the Lord I got, and every purpose of God revealed in my life, look at what is happening now. This thing that is happening will destroy the promises never. I said never. 
as it was written, everything that was written concerning you, if there's any persecution at all, it says, if there's any problem at all, all that persecution will lead you in the direction of what was written concerning you in Jesus' name. You will not be a failure. You'll be an achiever. You'll not be a defeated person. You'll have dominion in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Acts chapter 8, now verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and healing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, 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 because of that persecution, they that were scattered abroad, tell me the rest, went everywhere doing what? You see, the persecution spread the gospel. The persecution won a lot of converts to the Lord. The persecution did not destroy the church. It developed the church. And your persecution will not destroy you. It will develop you in Jesus' name. They had soul winning commitment. Number seven, they had single minded constancy single-minded constancy you see that persecution just made them to have one mind one heart one goal one interest one desire one pursuit and one activity that they concentrated on that's why it says acts of the apostles chapter 6 acts chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 4 but we will give ourselves a Addict ourselves, abandon ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Single minded constancy. That was the persecution did. If Saul had only known, if Saul had only known, if the people of this world only knew that persecution does not destroy the church. But it makes the church to grow. They're actually not hurting the church. They're helping the church to move on. We're moving on. I said we're moving on. I come to point number two. The power of our irresistible savior. The power of our irresistible savior. We're looking at Acts chapter 26 verses 12 all through to 15. Acts of the apostles chapter 26. And we're looking at it from verse 12. In verse 12, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me. And then we journeyed with me. And when we were all falling to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me. And saying in the Hebrew tongue, let's stop there for a moment. Was Saul the only person in the entourage going to Damascus? Tell me out loud. No, it was just one person. Out of the many people, who was the most wicked among all those people? Saul. And God caught the most wicked, converted the most wicked, wrote his name in the book of life, and then made use of him as a great mighty instrument in the hand of the Lord, and the people that were not as bad as himself. The people that were claim, Saul is the worst of us all. Saul is the most degraded sinner. Among us all, we are better. We are more righteous than him. All those people, they didn't surrender to Christ. They didn't yield to Christ. And God took the walls. And when Saul began to pray, and they saw the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, there is no record that all those people, that they now said, okay, we're going to surrender ourselves to the Lord. Since the ring leader, the captain of the gang, has surrendered to Christ, we're going to surrender to Christ. You know what I'm telling you? There are some bad, bad people that will get to heaven. And there are some people that are not too bad, not so bad, that will go to hell. The people who say, we are not that bad. 
He is the ringleader. He is the worst of us all. Some worst, some worst people, terrible people, criminal people, they will bow to Jesus Christ. And those who are claiming we're not that bad, we're not that bad, God will pass them by. God will not pass you by. The Lord doesn't want us comparing ourselves with so and so, so and so is so very bad. He can, he can submit to Christ. He has done so much evil. Me, what have I done? My own is little, little, little. I don't want anybody here allowing any little thing to make you not to surrender fully. I know you're a child of God. You're a minister of the gospel. And I know that God's hand is upon you already, but there's a level of submission we still need to have. You will surrender to Christ. And it will use you like you never dreamt in your life in Jesus name but now I'm reading on I'm reading on and it says Saul Saul why persecutest thou me it is hard for thee to kick against the priests and I said what thou Lord he didn't waste time he didn't shrug his shoulder he didn't do like Pharaoh he didn't do like Balak he didn't do like Herod he immediately he said what thou Lord and he said I am Jesus whom thou persecutors wait here a moment wait here a moment please you know sometimes the devil might uh, be suggesting in your heart in your mind and be saying like, uh, a christian christianity what's the difference between Christianity and other religions, if the other people, if they do their very best in their religion, maybe everybody will land in the same place eventually. What's the difference? The difference is this. Everybody knew and Saul knew that Jesus died some time before. And that then he knew that Jesus rose from the dead. And now Jesus is talking from heaven. Jesus is alive. I said, Jesus is alive. And my Jesus knows the name of everyone. He called him by name and said, Saul, Saul. And he even spoke in the language he understood in Hebrew tongue. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am, I am who? Tell me out loud. I said, tell me out loud. You know, if you are not because I'm preaching, I'll just leave. If, I, if I'm at home by myself, I come across a verse like that, and I have revelation, I will just stop there and celebrate a little and just know that my Jesus is alive. My Savior is alive. My Redeemer is alive. What have you got to fear? The one that redeemed you is watching you and is watching the is watching the project and watching the movement of all your enemies. And there you are in Damascus, and your enemy is on the road. And the Lord is watching and watching and watching. And before he gets to you in Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ makes him to fall to the ground. I think we ought to celebrate. I said, I think we ought to celebrate. And while the people in Damascus, and oh, God bless you, put your hands together for Jesus. Thank you. Choir, God bless every one of you. Amen. Uh, and now that's the final clapping. Let me preach now. And so they, they, they want, you know, all the believers in Damascus, they'll be afraid. They lock the door. Something is going to happen. We're going to die. No, you will not die. The Lord is taking care of the enemy on the way to Damascus. You know, sometimes we become very, very inquisitive. And it is because we don't know that our God is a great God. We're trying to find information. And we're trying to investigate. And we're trying to ask people, those who are in Jerusalem, we're trying to send text message. And now tell us what is happening over there in Jerusalem. Those people that uh, cause a lot of havoc, we're here in Damascus ask us are they coming are they coming those people in that neighboring country and those people in the other place i had they already arrested 50 out of those other nationals what are they planning what are they doing you make yourself uneasy unnecessarily what's your concern about that investigation nothing bad will happen to you i said nothing bad will happen to you while the man is coming from Jerusalem before he gets to Damascus, now, although the army, you know, the church did not have an army, there's a host of heaven. And he was arrested. 
I said he was arrested. And all your enemies are arrested in Jesus' name. You know, when you read the Bible, you understand the Bible. All these things they say is happening over there in that area I don't want to mention. And it's happening there in the place I don't want to mention. And it's happening there in the place I don't want to mention. There's none of your concern about that. I say there's none of your concern about that. Have you heard the news today? That's none of your concern. Have you read what they wrote about that matter today? That's none of your concern. Have, have you discovered what they now found, what they are now saying about this and that? Once I read this, once I read this, I get all the result here. I said all the result is here. And this, uh, the material, this, the, this is the authority that tells me that all my enemies are arrested. Your enemies are arrested. There's no fear anymore. We're going to keep on preaching the gospel in Jesus' name. When we finish on Saturday and you go back, you'll find victory is waiting for you. Because the Lord is on your side. The Lord is on our side. He said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. And now eventually, that's how the man was arrested. And that's how he became born again. Isn't it wonderful when your enemies get born again? Do you want them to be born again? Yes. If you say so, it will be so. Yes. Do you want your enemies to be born again? Yes. All those who are mad with anger. Do you want them to be born again? Yes. And then they come to sit under your pulpit. And you are the one that will hold them and dip them inside water and baptize them in water. I come to point number three. The purpose of his irrefutable salvation. The purpose of his irrefutable salvation. God has a purpose in the salvation of everyone. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Acts... Chapter 26, verse 16. It says in verse 16, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Pick that word, hold that word, underline that word, mark that word for this purpose. Every conversion has a purpose. Everyone that Christ saves, that Christ redeems, everyone that Christ brings into the kingdom has a purpose. You are saved. God has a purpose for your life. And it's not a small sin, a small purpose. God has, has a great purpose for your life as you are born again in Jesus' name. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister, to make thee, to make thee. Anyone that becomes an effective minister is the making of the Lord. And then it says, and a witness, anybody that becomes an effective witness is the making of the Lord. And the Lord said, that's the purpose that the reason I've appointed you and ordained you and brought you in and appointed you. And that purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. The Lord was telling him, I've given you some revelation now, but I'll appear to you again. The Lord will appear to you again. The Lord was repairing his mind. And he, and he was saying, although I've appeared to you, and this is a powerful uh, appearance that has a great impact in your life, I'll come again and I'll see and impart more into your life. And it was so for him, it will be so for us. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, verse 15. Acts chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. That's all. He became Paul. He became a chosen vessel. A chosen vessel. You'll be a chosen vessel. And then it says, To bear my name before the Gentiles. That's the purpose. That's the reason for which he was converted. To bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. And then in chapter 22 of Acts. Acts chapter 22. And I'm reading there from verse 14. Acts chapter 22. Reading from verse 14. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee. Has chosen thee. Do you accept that? 
has chosen you. Do you accept that? That thou shouldest know his will and see that just one and should hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto, unto who? All men of what that was seen and heard. What the Lord has planned and purpose will be fulfilled. In Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 7. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 7. Whereof, whereof I was made a minister. Can you see the fulfillment of the promise of God here? God said, I will make him. A minister, I will make him in the future at that time. But now, when Paul looked back, he started the ministry now and he's writing to the believers in Ephesus. He said, Thank God, no word of God will fall to the ground. Everything God has ever promised, He has fulfilled. And now He said, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual walking of his power unto me who am less than the least of the saints of all saints is this grace given that I should preach <laughs> you will preach then the reason why I was made a minister is that he will preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see, you will open their eyes to see. And when they see, they will yield to the Lord in Jesus' name. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And now what was the heart and the passion and the desire and the pursuit and the practice and the performance of Saul, of Paul, the apostle? Now that God had chosen him and God had appeared unto him and God made use of him, this man became very effective. The word of God prospered in his son and for you too, you will be effective. As God has favored you and given you the gift of grace and has called you unto himself to make you a minister in any area of his work he has appointed you forget what might have happened in the past from today the lord has shown you god is no respecter of business the same thing you had done for paul he will do in your life you will be effective your mind will be focused on your ministry and your eyes will be set on what the Lord had given you to do. His power will never fail. You'll never lack in your life in Jesus' name. And we're looking at Colossians chapter 1. He knew he had been made a minister and then he knew the purpose, the reason why. And he wanted to fulfill that purpose. If you have that desire to fulfill the reason and the purpose for which the Lord had called you, it will be done. I said it will be done. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21. And you that was sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now I see reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now he said all these Colossians that as God was walking on him, God will be walking on them. And that God will make them more reprovable and holy and, uh, and unblameable. And the same assurance we have that on every one of us, brother, sister, minister from anywhere and every direction, that same power will work in our lives in Jesus' name. If he continue, we're going to continue. I said we're going to continue. None of us will fail and fall by the wayside. You will not stop your ministerial journey in the middle of the way. You will get to the very end in Jesus' name. The power to make you continue, God will supply. The grace to make you continue, the Lord will supply. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached unto every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made, what? 
a minister. He always recognized that, that everything he did, everything he achieved, and all the success that, that was recorded concerning him, it was because the Almighty God had made him a minister who now rejoiced in my sufferings for you and feel of that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church whereof I am made what? He always remembers that. Always remember what God has made you. God has made you a minister, you'll be a minister. And then says, whereof I made a means according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from the ages and from the generations, and now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the, of the glory of, the, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you watch the hope of glory when we preach one in every man and teaching every man in all wisdom tell me the rest that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus that's the goal of your ministry and it will be achieved the goal in your own life is you yourself. You'll be presented perfect in the sight of the living God and faithfully see that has called you who will do it in your life. And now in your ministry, the people you are ministering to, they will receive the gospel. And the gospel will walk in their lives. And every purpose that God has ordained for the gospel to accomplish in their lives, it will be done in Jesus' name. So that shall present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto also I labor, striving according to his walking, which walketh how? How? Walketh in me mightily. This gospel will walk in you mightily. You'll be so powerful and so exalted and so charged and challenged and fired up that it will burn every weakness out of your life. This word we're hearing here will work in every one of us mightily. You accept that? Let's rise up and confess that before the Lord. Lord, I've heard your word and I'm not a weakling. I'm not going to allow anything to stop my way. Now I know that this word will work in me mightily. It will work in your life mightily. Accept that. Believe that. Receive that. And rejoice in that. I don't look at what has happened in the past and what may be happening now. Things are going to change. Things are going to change. And you're going to be mighty in the hands of the Lord. Thank the Lord for what you have heard. Rejoice in what you have heard. Believe what you have heard. And I believe that everything will work mightily. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. Remember God as a program, God as a program, and nothing, nothing, nothing can destroy the real that program. It's irreversible. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. That the program of God is irreversible in your life. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. God has a program, and that program includes you and God's pronouncement. That includes you. You are part of the church of the living God. And you are not just a minister. You, you are not just a member. You are a minister. A minister. And the goodness of God will never fail in your life. The promises of God will never fail in your life. The word of God will not fall to the ground. It will work in you mightily. And you have God's promise. God's promise that is irreplaceable. Nothing like this. Nothing like this. That will conquer every enemy. That will conquer every difficulty. That will crush every Goliath that come against your ministerial, ministerial assignment. You tell the Lord, I know your purpose is irrevocable. I know your promise is irreplaceable. I know your, your pronouncements are irrefutable. Your program irreversible. Lord, let me see that in my life. Let me enjoy that in my life. His power is irresistible. 
Accept that. Believe that. Rejoice in that. And then face the challenge ahead of you with a firm, courageous heart. With real conviction. And now you're going back into your ministerial assignment and you will prosper. The work of God will prosper in your hand. His purpose for you, irrevocable. Yes, for the old church, irrevocable. For every local church, irrevocable. You are his witness in that place where you are. His minister in that place where you are. His mouthpiece in that place where you are. God has a purpose for making you to be there and to make you a minister and a witness in that place where you are. And that purpose is irrevocable. And it will use his power, irresistible power, to move everything that needs to be moved away from wherever it is, so that you will succeed in the work he has called you to do. Let these words sink in into you. And don't be so sorrowful because of past persecution. The result, the result, the consequence of the persecution we have seen brought about spectacular conversion. Rejoice in your own life. That whatever the enemy tries to do, it's not going to destroy your ministry. Just going to make you see what you would not have seen. It's going to bring out Spectacular conversions, supreme consecration of the people of God as a result of a challenge coming from that direction. Rejoice in that, accept that, believe that, hold on to that. Whatever you have seen that your thought was negative against you, against your ministry. All it will do is that it will bring supreme consecration on your part because you are a true, faithful, honest, sincere child of God. It will give you strong conviction, strong conviction. And the world will never, never, never be able to erode, dilute, destroy, water down your conviction. The negative thing they do, their madness and insanity, will only lead you deeper on your knees, paying homage to Christ, your King, your Lord and Master. To grant you spiritual courage, the winds that blow, the storms that calm, they make those trees exposed to the wind and the storm. They make the trees strong. The persecution only gave spiritual spirit, imparted spirit, injected courage. To the people of God in the early church, that's what it will do for you. It will give us selfless communion, bind us together, increase and deepen the love of God in us. Because we sympathize and support one another, makes the love of God to flow and to reach. Every place in our lives, in our ministry, in our church. Our ministers to members, from members to ministers, from ministers to ministers, from members to members. To drive us to soul winning commitment. Soul winning commitment. And the good days of evangelism in the early church will come back again. What the persecution. It will give us single-minded constancy and loyalty and faithfulness. Tell the Lord all this that was seen. 
that the persecution produced in the early church, pray. You'll see it in your own life, in your own family, in our own church, in the local church, in the church at large. That this will lead us to greater victory, greater heights. Let's pray for the sinners in our communities. The persecutors in our communities. As Christ arrested Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus. That the almighty God who says, I am God, I change not. And Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. That in the same way, with the same power, with the same effectiveness, that our God will arrest all these persecutors and all these sinners. They will come to know the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. That irresistible saving power of Christ will bring them down to the ground. Bowing the knee, bending the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving their heart, their lives, their soul, their spirit, their mind, their totality unto the Lord. And the same supernatural conversion. Supernatural conversion. That was manifested in that arch enemy. That ring leader of the persecutors. That same saving power. Irresistible power. Were manifested on the persecutors of this present day. In every community where we have come from. And in every country where we have come from. And when Saul got saved, God said, I have a purpose for saving him. When you got saved, God had a purpose for saving you. We believe. We believe that purpose of God for your conversion must, must, must it will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. You have nothing to regret. You have nothing.